Hello, fellow rebel capitalists. Hope you're well. Wanted to go over some really incredible statements from Ray Dalio. Well, incredible if you're the mainstream media. Uh, pretty much, I would, for the rebel capitalist crowd, I think this is kind of uh, a known and really doesn't come as a surprise. But let's get into the article. This is from What's New Today. Uh, billionaire Ray Dalio predicts there is a 30% chance of a U.S. civil war in the next 10 years. I actually would peg that at probably, I don't know if, if I'd say 30% chance of U.S. civil war. I would say there's definitely a, a, maybe even a higher chance. I'd say 30 or 40% chance of war in the next eight years. Because that's really the conclusion of the fourth turning. And by the way, I went over this in last night's whiteboard video in step number three. I've got this pulled up right here. So if you guys want to check this out, check out more of my ideas on why I think this could happen and how this pertains to inflation, disinflation, deflation, uh, the stock market, housing market, etc. cetera. Uh, you can go check this out. The Title of the video last night was Inflation, Understand History So You Can Predict the Future. And you see right here on this whiteboard, uh, I've got lockdowns and then war. And I think that's kind of what the bond market and the gold market, well, at least the bond market could be uh, telling us, kind of confirming what uh, we've learned in the fourth turning, the book by Neil Howe. But going back to Dalio, uh, predicts a 30% chance U.S. Civil War in the next decade due to due to emotional political polarization, but says the Constitution will likely save the nation. Obviously, I hope he's correct. But he gives some really staggering statistics. And I guess this is a prediction that he made in his, in his new book. And his new book actually sounds really good. I think I might uh, pick it up and at least the audiobook version, and, and start listening to it. But Dalio explains he thinks there is a dangerously high risk the country will have a civil war. Within okay, we got that. He points to the ignored governance rules and the exceptional amount of polarization currently seen in this country, which I think will just get worse. And I'm not saying that. You, you guys know, but for if you're a new listener... Uh, I, I'm not just saying that right off the top of my head, just to be hyperbolic or to get clicks or to fear monger or something like that. I, I'm just kind of going through this rationally. Uh, what we have is an environment where the Fed is backed up into a corner, the government as well, where they have to continue to prop up asset prices. Well, that's going to benefit those who have assets. It's going to hurt those that do not because that's going to result in consumer price inflation. So if, or even if your assets aren't going up at the same rate as the level of inflation, then you're going to get pissed. And uh, the line in the sand throughout history is when people can't put food on the table, they can't afford energy, or they can't afford a roof over their head. That's usually when they get out the pitchforks and the torches. And so you have to ask yourself, okay, we're in that situation today. What got us? What put us into that situation? Well, you just look, well, it's government money printing, stimmy checks, uh, lockdowns, et cetera. And then you ask yourself, okay, will we most likely have more of that in the future or less? And I believe the answer is more. And uh, just almost for the sole reason, excluding everything else, that the government has to prop up the stock market. And the way they do that is just, just money printing, like we said earlier. So this creates further and further divide in society is what we're talking about with the wealth gap. So the greater that wealth gap gets, the more civil and social unrest you see. So I think there's the, the probability is high that we see more of this in the future, not less. And I don't think it's uh, hyperbolic to say that. I think it's grounded and just very, uh, and just a lot of common sense, fact, data, and history. You see, the problem there is that the average Joe and Jane doesn't understand what's going on behind the scenes from a standpoint of economics. So if you don't understand the economics, you know, what's going on with the Fed, the Fed's balance sheet, uh, the government deficit spending, 
the debt to GDP, uh, how the real economy really revolves around the stock market and asset prices as far as the level of consumption. If you don't understand those dynamics, like the average Joe and Jane or your friend and family member Fred, you could see how you could whistle by the graveyard and kind of not really knowing what that there was a tsunami underneath the water because all you can see is the surface. For example, and this is Dalio talking here, if there are close elections and the losers respect the decision, it is clear that the order is respected, he writes. When there is a fight and seizure for power is a clear signal of the great risk of revolutionary change with all the disorder that entails. He notes that people, including senior officials, have openly questioned the validity of recent elections and expressed their willingness to fight for their faith. Dalio cites several studies as, stati as statistical evidence of his claims of polarization within the country, which show the deep rift between the two political parties. And I, I don't think, I mean, who could disagree with this? A 2019 Pew poll found that 55% of Republicans and 47% of Democrats viewed the other party as immoral. Uh, and 61% of Republicans and 54% of Democrats said the other party didn't agree. Uh, I think there's a typo. Didn't agree with their values. I think that's what he's trying to say. Also, 79%. This is crazy. 79% of Democrats and 83% of Republicans said they had cold or very cold feelings for members of the other party. 57% of Democrats and 60% of Republicans selected very cold. He also cited, uh, and here you go. Th this is really, I think, where you can see this playing out in the mainstream media right now. And this is where it gets really divisive. And it, I think it turns into kind of a, a religion here. As he also cited another study that found that 80% of Democrats think the Republican Party has been overrun by racists. <laughs> okay. And 82% of the Republicans think the Democratic Party has been overrun by socialists. Now, I, I have a position here. <laughs> In my opinion, is yeah, the Republicans are correct on this one. I, I rarely agree with a political party. I dislike both parties equally. But come on here. I, I think the Republicans do. I think by the Democrats' own admission, they're socialists. I haven't most of them said yes, we're democratic socialists. They, I mean, they kind of wear that badge proudly. So I don't know that there's any I think that. 82% of Democrats would say that the Democratic Party has been overrun by socialists, and that's a good thing. So I don't think that's controversial at all. As far as 82% or 80% of Democrats think the Republican Party has been overrun by racists, okay. Uh, the proof, please. Uh, you know, that's just, I, I think the claim that the Democratic Party has been overrun by socialists is far easier to prove than what the Democratic Party is claiming of the Republicans. I'll just leave it at that. 2010 study reported nearly half Republicans and third of Democrats would be unhappy if their child marries someone of the other political party. <laughs> That's a jump. And, and just to give you some context here, I think this is important. That's a dramatic jump from the nearly 5% of both parties saying the same in 1960. And I can really confirm just from my own experience growing up. I mean, in the 1970s and, and the 1980s, that, it, that wasn't even a thing. Like, like what political, like nobody cared. Like you, that was never even a topic of discussion. I mean, I, I remember even in high school, I, even in college, and this would have been in the, the mid nineties for me, I can't, I don't know of one of my friends, parents that I, 
I, I met or knew or spoke to on the phone that I actually knew their, their politics, not even one that it just wasn't. And, and most of you on this live stream, I'm sure were alive at that time. And you can remember that, that nobody ever talked about that. It just was not important. And to see how far we have come uh, to, to where now a third, 33% actually not only kind of make that known as far as what their politics are, but would be unhappy if their child married someone of the other political group. I mean, that is, that's jaw dropping. But if that isn't a scary statistic, I don't know what is. So here they're showing more of these uh, images. I guess that was from the January 6th deal. Oh, that's from the January 6th. And this is, uh, who knows? I mean, just, oh yeah, here you go. ASU. I know they're, uh, in fact, that was Wednesday, wasn't it yesterday, Josh? Or on uh, a couple days ago? Yeah, so it's Friday today. But here, Wednesday, I know they're planning a huge protest on ASU campus over the uh, Rittenhouse trial and just saying that, you know what they say, just completely oblivious to facts. But, uh, you know, whether it's this, Antifa, BLM on the other side, I mean, you're seeing this as commonplace nowadays in the United States, rioting, looting. I mean, it's just kind of par for the course. I think people are just kind of callous to it now. Dalio points out six stages of the cycle of internal order disorder that ends in civil war and claims the United States is currently in the fifth phase. The trusted billionaire credits the constitution as the country's potential saving grace. You know, I actually, I, I mean, I agree with a lot of, in fact, I don't know if there's anything I actually disagree with here from what Dalio is saying. I, mean, I, I think he's hitting the nail on the head. Even more dramatic, a recent survey found 15% of Republicans and 20% of Democrats thought the country would be better off with the majority of the opposite. You've got to be kidding me. That can't be right. That cannot be right. Let me highlight this for you guys. I'm going to read this, but I, I, I can't. And I'll read this for the podcast and everything, but the, the, I have a hard time believing this. Hopefully this is wrong. Jeez. Even more dramatic, I guess Dalio says in his book, a recent survey found that 15% of Republicans and 20% of Democrats thought the country would be better off if a majority of the, op of the opposing party just died. Wow. I, obviously, I didn't read that prior to going live. Let me just... Say that one more time for those of the people who are just seeing the audio or just listening to the audio on the podcast. 15% of Republicans and 20% of Democrats thought the country would be better off if a majority of the opposing party just died. Man, that kind of, that gives you the chills right there, doesn't it? But Dalio says kind of our saving grace here, however, uh, that mitigates the need for panic by attributing the Constitution as the longest standing and most admired internal order. Yeah, yeah. I mean, normally I would say that people just ignore the Constitution, including the, the politicians that uh, you know take an oath to uphold the Constitution, ironically. Uh, but it's kind of has the same teeth as the, as the uh, Federal Reserve Act in the sense that they just kind of ignore it and do whatever they want to do, especially if there's a quote-unquote crisis situation. But recently, I've uh, been optimistic, and I, I've, I've been encouraged by these uh, district courts that uh, have shot down the medicine mandates from the Biden administration uh, because they are unconstitutional. So that's, I think, something, uh, again, that, that's encouraging. And maybe Ray's right. 
I, I mean, I definitely think he's right that the Constitution has a lot to do with a soft landing. Let's just use an economic term. If, from a societal standpoint, if we're able to kind of dodge the, the bullet of not just a civil war, but maybe a, a world war, uh, the Constitution is going to play a big part of that. Uh, just like the Constitution, and, and I would argue the, um, uh, well, pretty much all the documents going back to uh, the 1770s and kind of that attitude. You know, I, I was talking to a group of gentlemen last night and um, and uh, we we're discussing how we could draft a modern day like Declaration of Independence or a modern day constitution. Not that we'd want to change it, but we want to take the exact concepts and turn them into a written format that's very quick, very brief, that would uh, really not just open up people's eyes to the importance of freedom and liberty and really the concepts that the United States was built on, but also kind of be a, a figurative battle cry for the future, uh, for people to get motivated to really stand up for the principles we talk about on this channel all the time. And how obviously that would need to be based in the concepts of the uh, of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. So I, I, I again, I, I think I'm definitely seeing eye to eye here with with Dalio for sure. Okay, so now they just go into kind of Dalio's background and uh and bridgewater so that's what's going on with mr dally actually let me plug his book really quick here because it sounds like a great book his book is titled i know they had it up here there it is why nations succeed and fail and it looks like he talks about his uh his theory of, of, of debt cycles in here as well, which, which sounds like it kind of dovetails on what Neil Howe discusses in the fourth turning. So I'm definitely going to grab this audio book for sure. All right, guys, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Make sure that you're always standing up for freedom, liberty, free market capitalism. We'll see you on the next